Good morning and welcome to uh, this morning's episode of Coffee, Kids, and Sports Medicine. Thank you guys for joining us. It's nice to see some faces out there in the audience. Uh, as we work back towards uh, some normalcy and, and kind of uh, having these be live, we certainly are, are excited about that. Um, we have a limited capacity today here in the audience and then those of you joining us online as well, we'd really like to, to thank all of you for joining us. A couple housekeeping items. So as always, uh, please don't forget to, to, to log in and claim your CME credits. Um, we encourage you to submit questions to us. There's three ways to do this with our text, the email, or the YouTube login live chat function. Some up, or these are actually past um, lectures that we have done that are online on our on-demand site. So you can click this link and, and go to these and, and view any of these that you'd like to kind of log in and see. I do think some of these expire uh, at the end of the month. So uh, please jump on and, and review these. They're, they're great talks. Uh, upcoming events we have, we have these two talks coming up in April and May. They're going to be great. We'd love for you guys to join us for those as well. And then today we, uh, we have Dr. Jane Chung, who I'm here to introduce. She's a sports med medicine physician here at our Frisco campus. Um, she's also an assistant professor at UT Southwestern. Uh, she's board certified in pediatric and sports medicine. Did her fellowship at Case Medical Center, where she trained at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital of Cleveland, Ohio. She has a special interest in a female athlete and is a perfect person to be giving today's talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chung. All right. Good morning, everybody. All right. So we're going to be talking about some unique considerations uh, for the female athlete this morning. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. So... We see a 16-year-old female high school rower who presents to your clinic with mid to low back pain. She's preparing for her senior year and wants to row in college, and she's been complaining of some low back pain for about two months now. Initially, she reports that it was only with rowing, but prog progressively has been worsening and now is complaining that pain's even at rest. We also note in her growth chart that she's had some substantial weight loss over the past nine months, and her BMI has dropped from 75% to the 11th percentile. She reports menarche at age 12, but really hasn't had any period for the past six months. And she endorses some feelings of sadness, depression, but denies any suicidal ideation. Mom says she's a really good student. She's an all A honor student um, at her school. And you get radiographs of her low back. And on this lateral view, you see where the um, yellow arrow is. You uh, notice a lucency through the L5 pars interarticularis region which we see with uh, stress fractures in the low back, spondylolysis. So kind of keep her in the back of your mind as we go through our talk today. So the objectives for this morning are to discuss some unique um, principles unique to the evaluation and treatment for our female athlete population. We'll list the components of the female athlete triad and relative energy deficiency in sport using current nomenclature to address the spectrums of each component provide evidence-based information to parents and young female athletes regarding relationship between the triad and injury risk, especially bone stress injury, and discuss how sports medicine providers can best screen for and prevent negative consequences of this. So aside from the known benefits of improved cardiovascular fitness, strength and power, decreased morbidity and mortality with being physically active, we know that females who participate in sports tend to have higher self-esteem, get better grades in school, higher graduation rates, decreased teen pregnancy, decreased rates of smoking, drugs, depression, anxiety, and overall increased bone mineral density compared to their non-athletic counterparts. So as many of you know, in 1972, the government passed Title IX, which is a Education Assistance Act. And this led to a really big escalation in female sports participation. The um, act pretty much said that there needs to be equal opportunity for both men and women's program that's federally funded, including sports. So that meant equal opportunities for female collegiate scholarships um, and such, and hence led to a big boom in female sports participation following this passage. So when we look at anatomical and physiological differences between males and females, there are quite a few. So I just wanted to review some of them. So on average, when we look at body fat composition, females have about twice as much body fat on average compared to males. They also have less lean muscle mass. Females also consume more oxygen with weight-bearing exercise. And when you look at their total cross-sectional area in a muscle, females have less muscle compared to males in that cross-sectional area. 
Other anatomical differences, females have a smaller heart, smaller thorax and lungs, smaller um, uh, red blood cells with fewer than 6% um, red blood cells compared to their male counterparts. Their heart rates are, tend to be faster. They have about 10% less hemoglobin compared to males, and also their maximal rate of oxygen consumption with exercise tends to be lower than their male counterparts. This is a great book that was published in 2016 that looks at the musculoskeletal differences in males and females and also looks at um, it from a hormonal, anatomical, and physiologic standpoint um, in reference to sports medicine. So it's a great resource. So the female athlete triad was first described in 1997 by the American College of Sports Medicine, and they described it as a medical condition involving three components, which was initially osteoporosis, amenorrhea, and disordered eating. Since then, over the past several decades, they have updated and the definition has evolved um, with their latest consensus statement being released in 2014, which said that we now know that these three components lie in a spectrum and that they're all interrelated and that the key underlying root cause is low energy availability. So you can see that there's a spectrum of health where there's optimal energy availability, optimal bone health, and eumenorrhea at the far right end, and athletes can lie anywhere in between the spectrum. So again, the components include low energy availability, impaired bone health, and menstrual dysfunction, and the underlying root cause is low energy availability. And we know that the triad occurs when energy intake does not adequately compensate for exercise-related energy expenditure, meaning that the athlete is underfueling. So who's at risk and what are some of the risk factors? So we know that we tend to see the female athlete triad in those athletes who participate in sports that emphasize leanness, aesthetics, and those in weight class sports, such as our dancers, our gymnasts, our figure skaters, our distance runners, um, our cross country athletes, um, and then those in weight class sports like our wrestlers, cyclists, um, uh, uh, coxswains uh, with rowing, also, those athletes who are early sports specializers are at an increased risk as well. And we also know that those athletes who are su um, subject to family dysfunction, dieting, abuse, that those are all risk factors as well. So when we look at the definition of what is energy availability, it is the amount of dietary energy that's left to support other physiological functions in our body after you subtract the energy that's used in exercise. And so our body not only needs um, you know, energy and fuel for exercising, but also to carry out normal developmental uh, and reproductive and hormonal functions in our body. So the formula is dietary energy intake minus um, exercise energy expenditure, and it's in fat-free mass. So when we look at the spectrum again, we have those athletes who have optimal energy availability, meaning they're fueling well and they have um, you know, good energy availability to do all the things that they need, including exercising in their sport. There are those who are in the reduced energy availability category where most of our athletes kind of fall in the unintentional reduced energy availability where they're really active, they're running from class to class and practices, and they're just not fueling enough where they're skipping meals or in, in, um, uh, just having inadequate dietary intake where they're just not having enough fuel. And then there are those athletes who intentionally reduce their energy availability where they're purposely skipping meals or purposely restricting their intake. And these are the kids with some type of disordered eating behavior. And then those in the red zone are those with low energy availability. These are your athletes that you know, have either an official eating disorder diagnosis of anorexia, bulimia, or um, eating disorder not otherwise specified, or they um, uh, show some type of abnormal behavior such as such as restrictive eating, um, diet pills, they take laxatives, diuretics, binging and purging, those types of behaviors. So we know that the optimal energy availability for females is about 45 kcals per kilogram of fat-free mass per day. And that ensures adequate energy availability in physically active women. We know from research that anything less than 30 kcals of kilogram of fat-free uh, fat mass per day starts to negatively affect a female's metabolic, reproductive, and bone health, and we start to see these changes from a negative level. 
Low, bone mineral, uh, low BMI or body mass index is a strong predictor of low bone mineral density and stress fractures. And we want to ideally keep an athlete's goal weight at greater than 90% of their expected body weight. So I really like this um, figure because it kind of globally looks at what low energy availability does to the body. So if you have low energy availability, it sends a signal to the brain. And you can kind of see a cascade of all the pathways that it can negatively affect, being, you know, starting with um, uh, the reproductive system and decreasing um, bone mineral density, having a negative effect on bone health, decreases basal metabolic rate, decreases possibly the vascular function as well, um, also sends out different hormones from the intestinal GI system as well, um, decreases heart rate, blood pressure, and most importantly, from a performance standpoint, which is what our athletes care about the most, has a negative effect on their performance as well, too. Just a little bit of a review on menstrual function because it is specific to our females, female athletes. Um, Definition-wise, eumenorrhea is normal menstrual cycles. So this is optimal where you have a period every 28 days, plus or minus seven days. Oligomenorrhea is when your menstrual cycles are spread apart by more than 35 days. Um, primary amenorrhea is when you haven't started your menstrual cycles and you're 15 years or older and you have already developed secondary sex characteristics. Secondary amenorrhea is when you have started menarche but have not had a period for greater than 90 days. And functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is what we can see in our athletes with female athlete triad, where everything else is working fine, but they, don't, they have lost their period because of low energy availability. Um, looking at this figure on the right, uh, just a review of the normal reproductive hormone profile. So our um, cycles are in two uh, phases. So in the initial follicular phase, you have an increase in the estradiol hormone, um, and then you have a LH surge that um, stimulates ovulation. And when ovulation does not occur, then there is a spike in progesterone, which prepares for the menstrual uh, menstruation to uh, uh, start in the luteal phase. So this is another figure um, looking at the importance of estrogen and progesterone and how it plays a role in our body from a physiologic standpoint. Um, from a bone standpoint, estrogen is really important, as we'll talk about in a little bit. It stimulates osteoblast activity, which is bone building, and it inhibits osteoclast activity, which and it, meaning it inhibits bone breakdown. So it's really important for bone building. Also is an important role in gross motor control and muscle activation. They also um, uh, have an impact on ligaments and tendons, um, can contribute to increased ligamentous laxity, as we see in a lot of our females, also decreases tendon stiffness. Um, estrogen also plays a role in the articular cartilage by suppressing some of the hormones that cause um, articular cartilage breakdown. So a lot of important roles that these hormones play throughout our body that a lot of our athletes just don't know. When we look at bone health, peak bone mass that's attained during our childhood and adolescence is a major determinant of bone mass and fracture risk, risk later in life. And 90% of the peak bone mass is obtained by age 18 in our females in general and by 20 in our males. And you can see on this uh, graph that if a young adult's bone mineral density is just 10% higher than the mean, then you can reduce their stress fracture risk and delay age crossing to the osteoporosis threshold by 13 years. So that's a big, big deal just by having a bone mineral density that's 10% higher than the mean. So what influences peak bone mass? So the main thing is genetics. So genetics accounts up to 60 to 80% of a individual's peak bone mass variance. But aside from that, there are other contributing factors such as your nutrition, hormones, um, mechanical forces, so your impact activities, exercise, sports, gender also plays a role, and then other risk factors such as smoking, drugs, other lifestyle things that can have a negative effect on your peak bone mass. So early exposure does play an important role for bone accrual and growth in our pediatric population where 26% of your final bone mass is acquired between 11 and a half to 13 and a half years of age in our females and between 13 to 15 years of age in our males. And so early puberty is the most crucial time to participate in sports that emphasize 
weight bearing and high impact exercises. And if you look over on the right here, you can see that um, in females, this is just looking at females, that their peak bone mineral content velocity really starts to spike during their early puberty, kind of during when their menarche is going on. And their um, peak height velocity occurs right before they start their menarche. And so you can kind of see that this early pre-puberty area is very, very important time for females. Athletes who participate in weight-bearing sports have about 10% greater bone mass than their non-athletes, as several studies have shown. And Adam Tenford and Michael Fredrickson kind of looked at the influence of sports medicine on bone health in our young athletes. And what they found was that those athletes who participate in high and multi-directional impact loading activities enhance their bone mineral density and bone geometry, particularly in those anatomic locations that were directly loaded by their sports. And so what we mean by high impact is sports includes gymnastics, volleyball, karate, other jumping sports, multi-directional um, with soccer, basketball, racket sports like tennis. So those were kind of the sports that they looked at. In terms of research looking at participation in long distance running, they found that it may perhaps lead to modest improvements in bone mineral density and geometry versus those who participate in non-impact sports and sedentary individuals, but the results have been pretty inconsistent. So when we look at sports participation in bone health, there has been some studies that have looked at previous history of participation in ball sport, and they found that those athletes who participated in ball sports previously, like basketball, um, soccer, had about 50% reduction in stress fracture development in both sexes when they looked at track and field athletes. Also, um, Adam Tenford showed that 82% reduction in stress fractures for boy runners uh, were seen in those who reported a prior basketball participation. So I think that's kind of interesting as well. Those athletes who participated in previous ball sports um, tended to have decreased risk of stress fractures in track and field athletes. So why do we really care about the consequences um, and why do we really care about the triad? Well, the consequences of low energy availability are multiple. Uh, low energy availability crisis adversely affects bone health, reproductive system in females, cardiovascular health perhaps, and performance. So looking at bone health, Low energy availability suppresses the hormones that promote bone formation, as I mentioned earlier, such as estrogen. We know that low bone mineral density increases an athlete's risk for stress fractures. And we also know that low bone mineral density or impaired bone health changes may be irreversible. So how do we evaluate bone health from a clinical standpoint? Well, bone strength is determined by bone mineral density, bone mineral content, and bone quality, which looks at microarchitecture of the bone, geometry, and size. Currently, bone mineral density is what we use to evaluate bone health. It's evaluated within normal distribution, looking at the standard deviation units, and we use the Z-score, which is what's recommended by the International Society of Caloric Den uh, Densitometry for children and premenopausal females. And it looks at their age and sex match controls. T-scores are used um, for postmenopausal females, um, and so in our patient population, we use the Z-score. So what is low bone mineral density? So the, IC, the ISCD uses the term low bone mass for age as bone mineral density or bone mineral content Z-score. That's less than negative two. The American College of Sports Medicine defines low bone mass as bone mineral density or bone mineral content with a Z-score between less than negative one to negative 1.9, and athletes who are engaged in weight-bearing sports, and those who also have clinical risk factors, such as history of stress fractures, bone stress injuries, things like that. And so in our patient population and our athletes, we go by the American College of Sports Medicine definition with a Z-score of negative one to negative 1.9. So who should be getting these DEXA scans? So DEXA scans are what we use to evaluate bone mineral density in an athlete. And so the Female Athlete Triad Coalition consensus, consensus Statement published in 2014 kind of has these guidelines that I've put up here. So if an athlete has one or more high risk factor in clinic, then you may want to consider possibly ordering a DEXA scan. If they have two or more moderate risk factors, um, you can kind of see the criteria there. And so it kind of looks at 
um, their BMI, their age of menarche, their history of their menses cycles, um, their history of previous stress fractures or stress reactions, and any prior history of bone mineral density that may have been low. When we move on to the reproductive system, kind of reviewing how that can, um, how the female athlete triad can negatively affect it, <clears throat> we kind of see that when you have low energy availability, it places a negative input in our body's brain at the hypothalamus lab level. And so it inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone, which normally stimulates the pituitary glands to release, release the LH and the FSH hormones, which then normally stimulates the ovaries to release estrogen and progesterone to have normal menstrual cycles. But if there's negative feedback due to low energy availability, then this normal cascade doesn't occur. And so that's when the athlete may end up with having men normal or abnormal menstrual cycles, um, particularly functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is a cause of low energy availability. And this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You want to make sure that there are other things that are ruled out before you diagnose an athlete with functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, such as pregnancy, polycystic ovarian disease, and other structural abnormalities that may be preventing them from having normal menstrual cycles. So again, estrogen deficiency does negatively affect the bone by impairing um, skeletal muscle oxidative metabolism, also pr um, promotes bone reabsorption and inhibits bone formation, and additionally can uh, suppress some of these hormones um, to con that, that normally contribute with bone health. There's been a couple of studies that have looked at amenorrheic adolescent athletes and they have found that these athletes have had significantly lower bone mineral density compared to their healthy, normal cycling adolescent athletes. And so lumbar bone mineral density and weight-bearing bone mineral densities were predicted positively by their estradiol hormone level and negatively by their duration of amenorrhea and their age of menarche. So a common myth that we oftentimes hear are athletes say, most of my teammates lose their period during track or cross country season, so it must be normal. And frankly, Dr. Chung, I really like not having my periods during my track season because it's kind of a pain. Yes, well, that's all true. We want to make sure that we tell our athletes losing period while in season is not a normal response to training, right? This is likely a sign of low energy availability or that the athlete is under fueling and you should discuss with your coach, athletic trainer, or medical provider is the advice that we want to give. A uncomfortable topic that a lot of our female athletes, um, including myself when I was growing up playing sports, we always you know, worried about were our periods, right? And so something um, that you may wanna discuss with our female athletes is being prepared with a athletic period pack. So you have a little bag that has hand sanitizer, change of clothes, extra pads, tampons, anti-inflammatories for cramps, plastic bag, things like that so that they're prepared and just have it thrown in your, you know, athletic sports bag or in your sports locker. Um, other considerations, you know, sometimes discussing tailoring their nutrition when they're in cycle or their training regimen during their menstrual cycle as well. So, you know, if they have really bad cramps or it negatively affects them and they're really fatigued or whatnot, instead of going on high intensity aerobic during that time of their menstrual cycle, they may want to focus a little bit more on resistance training or strengthening or things like that. So those are all considerations um, that are important to consider in our female athletes as well. Also, there are a lot of good um, apps um, with menstrual cycle tracking apps so that athletes can kind of track and kind of anticipate when their cycles may be coming. Um, the US World Cup women's team um, they had their training regimen kind of um, catered and tailored around um, their menstrual cycles and things like that as well too. So, um, you know, professional female athletes are doing this um, as well. What about cardiovascular health? So endothelial dysfunction is an important predictor of coronary endothelial um, uh, atherosclerosis and car uh, cardiovascular disease. There have been two big landmark studies that were done in 2002 um, and one in particularly was the uh, single largest female cohort study to date, and it showed that a history of irregular menstrual cycles was linked to up to 53% higher risk of 
coronary artery disease versus those females who had normal regular cycles. Another study looked at serum estrogen and coronary artery disease and premenopausal females, and they found that those premenopausal females who were estrogen deficient were more likely to have coronary artery um, disease documented on angiography. So menstrual dysfunction has been correlated with endothelial dysfunction in some of these studies, along with unfavorable lipid profiles, such as elevated LDL. And so, um, you know, these studies were not exclusive to adolescent females, but did include some of this population. And so certainly these findings do raise concern that an athlete with the female athlete triad may be at risk of developing coronary artery disease later on. And they've done uh, a study on professional dancers, ballet dancers in particularly, um, looking at those dancers with um, abnormal menstrual um, cycles compared to those um, with normal cycles. And they did find that um, there is a correlation with decreased flow-mediated dilation, which kind of measures indir indirectly endothelial dysfunction. What about performance consequences, right? This is what our athletes kind of really care about the most. And if we are able to kind of educate them that, hey, this affects your performance as well, um, you know, it might be that um, uh, they start to realize that, hey, this is not, you know, this is not something that I should ignore. So the triad has been linked with decreasing performance, decreased training responses. So the athlete may say, hey, doc, I'm training just as hard, but not having as much gain. I don't know what's going on. They may also have increased healing and recovery times and also complain of increased fatigue as well. Globally, two times as many young females than males perceive themselves as overweight, and nine times as many lean females and lean males are actively trying to lose weight. So definitely more of a female prevalent problem, but we'll talk about how it can affect males as well in a little bit. So this concept of rel uh, relative energy deficiency in sport was first coined by the International Olympic Committee in 2014, where they thought, hey, there's other things besides the triad that low energy availability can negatively affect and probably not um, uh, and not limited to, but can affect metabolic rate along with menstrual function, bone health, but also immunity, protein synthesis, cardiovascular health. And so these are some of the potential health consequences that are um, that the relative energy deficiency in sport can affect. And so you see that the female athlete triad makes up this little triangle right here with menstrual dysfunction, impaired bone health, and low energy availability. But relative energy deficiency in sport is also saying, hey, it can negatively affect immunological, GI, cardiovascular, psychological, growth and development, hematological, metabolic, endocrine, may affect all these other systems as well in the body. And some of the potential effects on sport performance as well that are similar to the triad. So there are some parallels with the female athlete triad and male athlete. And since 2015, um, Several researchers have been saying, hey, there's something similar that probably goes on in our male athletes, but obviously there have been decades and decades of research that has already be, been performed on female athletes. And so the parallels are you can have low energy availability. It can also negatively affect bone mineral density. And whereas females um, may have menstrual dysfunction, we now know that males can have negative effects with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Last year, um, a consensus statement was published in Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine um, by Aurelia Natif, who is one of the um, researchers um, that do a lot of great research um, in female athlete triad, and a lot that we know now are due to her and Jane D'Souza and all, uh, a lot of these uh, researchers listed here. But they published the male athlete triad and so it was a consensus statement from the Female and Male Athlete Triad Coalition um, that was released. And so what the Male Athlete Triad is, is low energy availability, impaired bone health, but from a reproductive suppression, male athletes can have low testosterone, oligospermia, and decreased libido. And so certainly can affect our male athletes as well. So the bottom line is we don't want to certainly forget about our male athletes because they can have negative health consequences similar to the female athletes as well.
So when we're screening and diagnosing the female athlete triad or relative energy deficiency in sport, what are some of the best ways to screen? So for general pediatricians, during your pre-participation physical evaluation annually or during their yearly checkup, um, for us, for sports medicine providers, office visits, we may have some athletes who come in for reoccurrent injuries, reoccurrent stress fractures or bone stress injuries, or they're just getting sick and ill all the time. So those are good screening opportunities. You only need one of the three triad components to be diagnosed with the female athlete triad. And if the athlete has one component, you certainly want to evaluate if other components are present as well. This is a great resource, the Female and Male Athlete Triad Co Coalition that's online. Um, the website is listed right here. They have excellent um, graphs, um, infographics, information, education materials for parents, athletes, healthcare providers, um, and so it's really fantastic. I am a member of the Female and Male Athlete Triad Coalition. You can also look up um, any physician that treats female athletes, um, and so you can type in a zip code and you can see kind of um, a provider will pop out. So these, this is a great resource, and it also has a lot of um, stories that um, previous athletes, um, including professional athletes who have had the female athlete triad, kind of tell their story um, as well. So really great resource. So the Female Athlete Triad Coalition recommends some screening questionnaires. The ones highlighted in red here are actually part of the fifth edition PPE physical, uh, pre-participation physical evaluation form that the AAP puts out. And then the rest are um, uh, the questionnaires um, recommended by the triad. So if you kind of ask some of the questions highlighted in red and the um, athlete answers affirmative, you may want to go more in detail and ask the rest of these questions. So these are good screening questionnaires that I ask if I'm concerned about the female athlete triad in any of my patient population. So risk stratification, what is most important to screen for? So we ask in our intake history of um, menstrual, like menarche in our female athletes, um, you know, if you see any irregularities or things like that, that can be a um, clue to you that you may want to um, ask some further questions. Medication history, history of stress fractures, any family history of osteoporosis. Oftentimes, these athletes have a specific type of personality where they are high achieving, really good students. They have this obsessive, pers uh, perfectionistic type of quality or characteristic. Um, Overtraining, um, early sports specific training is also a kind of a risk factor as well. Reoccurrent and non healing injuries, these may kind of be red flags as well. So in diagnosing the female athlete triad, a thorough evaluation is really important, and it involves a multidisciplinary healthcare team. Also, the athlete must be honest and willing, so honest about their food intake, how much they're exercising, their BMI, things like that. And so um, oftentimes having a sport dietitian or a nutritionist, exercise physiologist, um, counselor, those are all important members of a multidisciplinary team. I have a female athlete triad clinic. Uh, once a month um, in conjunction with Taylor, who is our registered sport dietitian, where we see some of these athletes. Oftentimes, these kids will have a normal physical exam, um, but sometimes they may have a very low BMI um, and low body weight. They may have bradycardia, sometimes orthostatic hypotension, um, other signs. Um, you, may, you may also, you know, notice some calluses in their knuckles if they have um, been trying to uh, induce uh, vomiting after they eat. So some of these physical signs may sometimes be seen, but usually their exam is oftentimes normal. So how do you approach these at-risk athletes, right? So listen and talk. You never want to be judgmental or just kind of come out and say something's wrong with you, right? And so um, I found that, you know, kind of oftentimes saying, hey, I've noticed that you've had several stress fractures lately, and sometimes these injuries can occur if your bones aren't healthy or if your body may not have enough energy to meet the demands of your sport. And so kind of bringing it up um, in a um, you know, way that the athlete can kind of understand and but showing your concern. Um, you know, education is important. You always want to involve the parents, the guardians, the team physician, um, the athletic trainers. 
Um, athletic trainers oftentimes spend more time with our young athletes than their parents because they're always training, they're with them on the sidelines, at the games. And so um, athletic trainers are great resources and they will pick up on some things like this and they even may come to you um, as a clinician or their team physician and say, hey, I'm concerned about this athlete. Also pay attention to the pre-participation uh, screening questions and recognize the red flags as we had just reviewed. So this month is National Athletic Training Month, um, the, uh, the month of March. And so we have a fantastic team of athletic trainers in our sports medicine department. And so want to really thank them and we appreciate all their support. And they are a huge and important part of our sports medicine team. And so um, just a shout out to all the athletic trainers out there. So in 2014, the Female Athlete Triad Coalition Consensus Statement released some guidelines for those athletes that are at high risk and in terms of return to play and sport. And so this is a cumulative risk assessment and it's a great tool. Um, it, you can find it on the British Journal of Sports Medicine in the 2014 article that was published in. And it kind of looks at the risk factors and it helps you magnify and look at the risk of your athlete. And so it asks questions about energy availability, do they have any dietary restrictions, um, and you kind of check on where they um, meet, what is their bone mineral, or what is their body mass index, so um, do they have low BMI, um, normal BMI, what is their menarche status, uh, what is their menstrual cycle status, so are they having irregular periods, are they normal, healthy, if they've had a um, DEXA scan before, um, what is their uh, bone mineral density, and then also looks at their history of stress fractures and stress reactions. And you kind of total each column up. So the low risk um, gets zero points, anything in the moderate risk column gets one point, and anything in the high risk check each gets two points. And so you total those up and um, kind of look at this uh, score. And so any athlete who adds up a total of zero to one point um, have full clearance, um, those with two to five points that you've added up, they may have some provisional clearance or limited clearance. Um, you may reduce their training regimen, may want to increase their caloric intake, kind of make some recommendations, but they're not fully restricted. Um, and any athlete with greater than or equal to six points, this um, cumulative risk assessment recommends that the athlete be restricted from training um, and or competition or even disqualified depending on how concerned you are, you know, is their BMI super low? Um, they, you know, they've got multiple stress fractures, so it kind of helps you um, assess these athletes and in turn um, look at their return to play guideline as well. Um, the cumulative risk assessment scores, um, they've done some research and some good papers have come out and have shown that when they looked at about 79 collegiate female runners, that it predicted future bone stress injuries um, with each additional point increasing risk by 13%. And they also found that each one point increase in the cumulative risk assessment score was associated with about a 37% increase in prospective bone stress injury risk in male runners. And so pretty good, the cumul cumulative risk assessment score is pretty useful in determining uh, future bone stress injuries as well. So what's the treatment for these athletes? The number one treatment is restoration and normalization of body weight and their energy availability status. Uh, and in doing so, this will help restore menses and also improve bone health. So optimizing energy status is the number one treatment um, uh, for these athletes. And again, it really involves a multidisciplinary team approach involving the physician, dietitian, mental health professionals often are involved in the team, coaches, athletic trainer, and most importantly, the athlete. Globally, when you kind of look at treatment for the female athlete triad, um, recovery of energy status or low energy availability, this is the easiest and the quickest. Depending on how severe it is, can take days to weeks, and the outcomes are you increase the um, athlete's energy status, and then you also want to decrease their training intensity or levels so that they are able to get to that optimal energy availability status. And then in terms of recovery for their menstrual status, this process can take months, sometimes even up to a year, where by restoring their energy availability, the body is also able to turn back on 
and um, have normal menstrual cycles again and hormones. And then in terms of recovery of bone mineral density, for those athletes who you do a DEXA scan and they're found to have low bone mineral density, reversing this process can sometimes take years and can sometimes be irreversible. And so that's why it's really, really important that we catch these athletes early and kind of intervene. Another myth, um, birth control or hormonal contraceptives are a cure to restore your menstrual cycle after it has been absent, All right? So these periods of monthly bleeding in female athletes on the pill are not from naturally occurring estrogen, but instead you get bleeding through withdrawal bleeding. So oftentimes um, it's a misconception that if an athlete has a female athlete triad and they've lost their periods, hey, we can just stick them on the pill and we'll, we fix the problem because they're having their periods again. Well, that's not actually the right treatment for it. You want to treat the underlying cause, which is improving their energy availability status so that the body naturally kicks up normal menstrual cycles again. What about hormone replacements, right? So again, you know, I lost my period during cross country season and my doctor wants to put me on the pill, right? You wanna say, wait, this may be your body telling you that your hormones aren't working properly because of your low energy availability and you need to have a, a conversation about addressing why you're missing your period, right? There can be other reasons for missed periods, like we talked about pregnancy, chronic diseases, polycystic or ovarian syndrome, other things that we need to evaluate and rule out. The Endocrine Society uh, recommends against uh, combined oral contraceptives for the sole purpose of improving bone mineral density. However, Kate Ackerman and her group have done a study where a short trial of transdermal estrogen patch with cyclic oral progesterone can be used for those athletes with um, who are at risk for low bone mineral density but have normal weight and are cycling normally otherwise. So what are some strategies that we can implement for bone health in our young athletes? Focus on the female athlete triad risk stratification to address any biological risk factors for low bone mineral density. You want to ensure that they're getting adequate calcium and vitamin D, nutrition, looking at their overall energy availability status. Um, adequate sleep may also help promote bone health as well. And appropriate loading activities during the critical period of youth, as we talked about, the early puberty period. General calcium and vitamin D recommendations um, in our pediatric population in general um, in uh, most of the patients that we treat in nine and older, 1,300 milligrams of calcium um, daily, and then vitamin D, 600 international units is what they recommend. Oftentimes, our athletes do need more than that to reach a level greater than 30. So 30 is anything 30 um, and above is uh, normal vitamin D level. And so there's been a lot of research that's been done on female military recruits um, and uh, naval uh, cadets that have shown that those athletes who have um, a vitamin D that's higher, more closer to like in the 50s, have been shown to have decreased risk of stress fractures with optimal vitamin D and calcium. So oftentimes we will recommend in our athletes, particularly in our weight-bearing athletes who are at risk, maybe even taking you know 800 to 1,000 international units a day. If their vitamin D is found to be very low, such as um, they classify for vitamin D, uh, deficiency, then sometimes they do need to be on a prescription high-dose vitamin D uh, for several weeks to kind of um, get them in the um, optimal zone. So why do we care about the triad so much, right? So it does possess, um, pose significant health risks, and sometimes these consequences can be potentially irreversible, as we talked about um, from a bone health standpoint, and also dictates the need for prevention, early diagnosis, and treatment in our young female athletes. This is a great resource um, that the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Council of Sports Medicine and Fitness has put out. Um, uh, Dr. Amanda Weiss Kelly and Suzanne um, Hecht, uh, who are my mentors um, on this female athlete triad uh, statement. It's a great resource. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. That's a really good question. So we know that when you first start 
your periods or when you um, start menarche, having some irregularity in your cycles in the first one to two years is normal. And so, you know, if, you know, they say, oh, you know, I had my period, but it only lasted for a day. And then now I've had some spotting. Um, when they're first starting out, you know, some irregularity in their cycles is expected. And I usually give it about one to two years and kind of keep an eye on it. So I don't think if they say, oh, I just started my period, you know, earlier this year and their cycles are irregular, I don't think you need to jump the gun and do a lot of workup, but just kind of keep an eye on it um, and see, you want to make sure that it does normalize. But it is normal and not um, abnormal to have some irregularity in the first one to two years. Great question. Um, the female athlete triad um, that I just showed on here, this is a great resource and it kind of goes through um, some of the uh, workup um, that pediatricians can often uh, do, but um, you kind of want to look at the athlete in general. When did they start the menarche? Um, when was the last time they had their menarche? So if they haven't had one, you know, and say they've only had like six in the past year or so, and they start and they're you know 15 years old, but they started menarche at you know 11 or 12 years of age. That's certainly a con uh, concern. Kind of getting a good diet history, exercise history, um, any other you know medications that they may be taking, and then kind of going from there. And if you feel like yeah, this is certainly you know I don't see any reason why they should all of a sudden have stopped their period. Then as a general pediatrician, for instance, you can kind of do a workup for looking at other anatomic or structural abnormalities that may have caused them. Obviously, ruling out pregnancy is one of the most important things you want to do as well, but um, kind of going from there. And then if you, if some of the things that you've tricked off, a lot of pediatricians will often um, start them on progestion for stimulating withdrawal bleeding, bleeding to make sure that there isn't anything else that's going on as well too. And if all of that checks off normal and you're still kind of stumped about why they are not having their period, then you know you you certainly want to start thinking about the female athlete triad. Yeah. Yeah. So 15 is what we um, what um, what currently they say. So if a female has not had their menarche by age 15, but they've developed secondary sex characteristics like breast development. Um, pubic hair, that type of stuff, then that's the age that they look at. Certainly there are some with delayed onset of puberty, so that's a little bit different. But 15, if they develop other secondary sex characteristics, and then um, anything, uh, if they haven't had a period for more than 90 days is what we call secondary amenorrhea for those athletes who have started um, uh, menarche. Very good question. Yes. So... Uh, the recommendations are if you have an athlete who have had that you have ordered a DEXA and they have been found to have low bone mineral, bone mineral density, you may want to check it on a yearly basis, nothing sooner because it does have some radiation and things like that. Also, um, in terms of DEXA scans for female or for um, pediatric patients and adults, it's very different. So, for young patients. Um, 18 and younger, you want to do whole body, less head is kind of the protocol that you use because um, the protocol that they use for adults looking mostly at the spine and the hips is not very accurate in um, the young pediatric population. And so the protocol that you order would be different. Also, you want to make sure that whoever is reading it, the radiologist, that their system has a um, pro um, program that looks at um, pediatric patients in terms of looking at um, standard units for their age and their sex matched because you shouldn't be looking at the same Z scores for adults compared to pediatric patients. And so wherever you may send them to to have the DEXA scan performed, you want to make sure that they have it calibrated for the pediatric population. Yeah, so if you don't have access to a DEXA, um, I think certainly that's fine. You can do um, some of the basic uh, blood work, which I didn't go over this talk, but again, um, this, um, this uh, paper does have uh, a good chart of some of the basic um, bone health blood work to kind of um, order, but uh, you can do, you know, checking their vitamin D, calcium, some of their electrolytes, their hemoglobin, their iron levels, their thyroid levels, kind of looking at all of that to make sure from a nutrition standpoint 
that you don't see any deficiencies. Um, also, um, any history of stress fractures can be very helpful for you as well. And then um, if you don't have a, a DEXA scan access, but you are really concerned about the patient's bone health, um, then certainly, um, and you've done some of the uh, bone health blood work and the basic workup, certainly um, you can have a uh, endocrinology consult to make sure that there isn't any like metabolic bone disease or things like that that may be going on. But DEXA scan, like I said, if you don't have access to it right away, you can still try to address the nutrition standpoint, the energy availability standpoint, um, and hopefully through that you can also improve um, uh, the menstrual dysfunction as well, too, if the athlete has that. Um, so that's a good question. You know, these patients are oftentimes very challenging, as um, you may know, um, especially with a um, single sport specialization, single sport specializing um, athletes. And so, um, you know, these athletes are usually very good, not only athletes, but they're also very good athletes um, academically as well. They kind of have that personality of perfectionistic, obsessiveness, you know, they're straight A students. And so these, these patients are certainly very challenging um, when we do encounter them. And so I think when, you know, when I personally encounter an athlete that I am worried about burnout, um, overtraining, and possible female athlete triad and low energy availability, um, you know, I think it's important that you kind of talk to them about some of the some of your concerns from a physiologic and health standpoint, um, obviously tying it in with how it can negatively affect their performance also gets good buy-in from the athletes. I think that's the number one thing that I found that, um, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of females are like, I'm really happy when I lose my period when I'm in season. And so kind of translating to them, this can negatively affect your bone health later on and you can have increased risk for osteoporosis, stress fractures, you might not be able to exercise long-term as healthy as you want to be because right now you're not laying a good foundation for your bones. Also, um, really harping on the negative consequences it can have on their performance immediately because that's what a lot of our young athletes just focus on, right? It's just what's in front of them right now. And so, you know, it might be that you're not recovering as quickly from your injury right now because you're not optimizing your nutrition and your energy and you're you know, you're spending a lot more energy than what you're taking in. And so, you know, you need to maybe perhaps decrease your training regimen while we try to optimize your caloric intake so that we can get you to that healthy point again. Um, you know, it also can decrease your running time. You know, a lot of times the kids will come in, especially the track athletes or the cross-country athletes will say, you know, I had a um, male athlete come in and say, main complaint was decreased running time, Right. And so they came to see me in sports medicine clinic for decreased running time. Well, yes, I was concerned about the male athlete triad and that athlete. And so kind of, you know, talking to them about some of the negative performance consequences is what I found to be kind of helpful in kind of opening up their ears to this. So, Yeah, so, you know, at our facility, like Dr. Miller said, yeah, we're really... Um, uh, fortunate to have um, great resources. And so we have, um, myself, we have uh, Taylor, who is a registered sport dietitian who works closely with these athletes. Um, when I see them in clinic, um, she will see them with me and then also has follow-up appointments to make sure that they are being um, uh, followed um, and kind of following their recommendations to optimize their nutrition and their energy availability. We also have our psychology team, Dr. Stapleton, who works with um, some of our athletes in terms of kind of um, giving them extra support. Um, these patients, like I said, are oftentimes very challenging, and oftentimes the athletes may not know that, you know, this is why that they're getting injured or this is why that they're having performance issues. And so just kind of really working with a multiple, multiple disciplinary team is important. Also, our physical therapy um, team is really important, too, and kind of helping the athletes not only recover from their injury, but also kind of helping them safely get back into sport and activity, or if we need to cater their activity regimen in the meantime while we try to get them healthy again, they also play a um, pivotal role as well, too. So um, lots of um, lots of different um, uh special, um, you know, special teams, so to say, that um, require to help treat these athletes.